uh, Math 1050 College Algebra. This is episode 25, and I'm Dennis Allison. Uh, you know, we've been talking about matrices, how you multiply matrices, find the inverse of a matrix, and some of the applications for this sort of thing. Uh, today we look at something that's related to that. Uh, let's go to our list of objectives. Today we're going to introduce uh, these 2x2, uh, 3x3 two two, three three determinants and larger determinants. Uh, we'll also look at how determinants uh, are related to deciding whether a matrix has an inverse, so determinants and inverse matrices. Uh, then we'll look at the three elementary operations that we can perform on determinants. These are the same elementary operations that we performed when we were reducing matrices, although now we'll be applying them to both rows and columns. And finally, we'll look at one of the, one of the primary applications of determinants, not the only one, but uh, Kramer's rule. And uh, these things are all in your text. So uh, let's look at, first of all, what is a, a determinant? Okay, let's begin by tying this in with something we've already seen. You know, normally for a matrix, we use a capital letter to represent the matrix, for example, a capital A. And if this is a two by two matrix, then uh, the entries um, in a two by two matrix, I might call A, B, C, and D. You know, there, there's another way of uh, writing the matrix. That is, you can use parentheses. Uh, in your textbook, you sometimes see parentheses used. Uh, a, B, C, and D. But what you never see here are vertical bars because that represents something else. In fact, that's, what, that's the notation that we use for a uh, determinant. Now, if I want to take the determinant of A, the way I'll abbreviate that is I'll put vertical bars on the A's. Looks sort of like an absolute value, but it doesn't mean that. Uh, another way to, to abbreviate determinant of A is to write DET parentheses A to mean the determinant of A. And then when I go to actually express the two by two arrangement, I'll put vertical bars out here and I'll put A, B, C, and D. Now, the way I evaluate a determinant is I multiply the number in the first row, first column times the number in the second row, second column, A times D minus B times C. And that would be A, D minus B, C. In other words, I take this product minus that product, and I come up with a real number answer. You know, for a, for a matrix, you never get a real number answer for these things. One matrix can equal another matrix, but a matrix doesn't ever equal a, a real number, not if it's like a two by two matrix. But for a determinant, it has a real number value. Let me just work an example right below here. Suppose I had the determinant uh, four, negative two, negative three, and five and I want to find the value of this determinant. Well, I take the product four times five minus the product negative two times negative three. Negative two times negative three. Now that's going to give me 20 minus six is 14. So I say 14 is the value of this determinant. Um, you know, another uh, representation for a matrix going back up to this first notation that you haven't, uh, I don't know that we've used this much, this notation in class, is another way I could represent matrix A is I could say that the entries are, I could use a little a for every entry, A11, A12, A21, A22. Now this time I'm putting two subscripts uh, below, or, or just below and to the right of each of each A, and this represents first row, first column, first row, second column, and then second row, first column, and then second row, second column. So in other words, the two numbers that you see in the subscript represent the row number and the column number of that entry. Now that would be equivalent to saying A, B, C, and D, but this way quickly I can identify which position the number came from. So in this case, uh, well let's see, for a determinant, if I were going to take the determinant of A, I would write this as A11 times A22 minus A12 times A21. Okay, let's work another example now of a two by two determinant and then we'll look at it from a slightly different point of view. So I have, uh, I have two ways of representing the entries of a matrix and that gives me two ways of expressing the value of this determinant. Okay, so another two by two example. Suppose this time I had matrix B and uh, the entries of matrix B this time might be uh, 0 and 4 and negative 3 
and negative one. And I'd like to evaluate the determinant of matrix B, which I'll write as the determinant, zero, four, negative three, negative one. Now once again, I'll take this product minus this product. So that'll be zero times negative one minus four times negative 13. And I get zero plus 12 is 12. Okay, so that's said to be the value of this determinant. The matrix had no value, but the determinant does. Okay, now that's sort of the, uh, sort of the quick way of evaluating a determinant, a two by two determinant. Now let me show you another way, uh, uh, another definition for evaluating it, and this definition can be expanded to larger determinants. Uh, you know, one thing I haven't mentioned yet so far is that when you take the determinant of a matrix, the matrix has to be square, like a two by two or a three by three. So if I were to give you a two rows, three columns, you couldn't take a determinant of that. Okay, so going back to the two by two case, suppose I want to take the determinant, this time I'll use this notation, I want to take the determinant of a matrix C, and let's say the entries of the determinant this time are five, two, three, and four. Five, two, three, and four. Now, I want to look at this from a slightly different point of view. The number in the very first position is said to be in a positive position. It has nothing to do with the fact that five is positive. We just say that the number in the first row, first column is in a positive position. The number in the first row, second column is in a negative position. So positive and negative. And the signs alternate going down as well. Five's in a positive position, three's in a negative position. And if three is in a negative, then this is in a positive position. So I'm thinking that the signs here will be a plus, minus, minus, and plus. Now, so every position, the number, uh, every, every position within the determinant has a sign associated with it. Now, the way I might expand the determinant this time, it's going to give me the same answer I would get in any other way. I, in, in the other way I expanded it, is I would take the number five. And the number five is in a positive position, so I'm going to put a plus in front of that. And if I remove the row and the column that the five is in, I'm going to multiply it by the number four. Five times four. Okay, now I come to the number two. And the number two is in a negative position, so I'm going to put a negative in front of it, so that'll be a subtraction sign. And if I remove the row and the column that the two is in, I'm left with a three. I'm going to multiply it by three. So this gives me five times four minus two times three. Now you know this time the reason I have a minus here is because I say two is in a negative position. And this gives me 20 take away six, 20 take away six is 14. You notice that's the same thing as taking the product five times four minus the product two times three. Now the number four is said to be the minor M-I-O-R-N, M-I-N-O-R, uh, is said to be the minor of the number five, and the number three is said to be the minor of the number two. That is, when I remove the row and the column the two is in, I'm left with this minor right here. Now, when I include that sign, either the plus or minus sign with the minor, then this is said to be the cofactor of, uh, of two, and four is said to be the cofactor of five. Let's go to a graphic right here that will summarize some of this information. Okay, so you notice uh, here for the two by two case, uh, I've indicated that the signs are positive and negative, alternating on the first row. They also alternate going down, plus and then minus, but along the main diagonal, they're all pluses along there. And so when I go to expand a two by two determinant, uh, this is the formula I think you'll want to use right here. That's multiplying A11 times A22. That would be this product along here minus A12 times A21. Now, before I talk about the three by three case, let's work an example. So let's go to the green board. Suppose I have this determinant, uh, four, one, negative two, zero, three, five, minus one, four, minus, minus one again. Okay, I'd like to expand this. Now, this time, I'm thinking that the number four on the first row, first column is in a positive position, and the signs alternate going across, minus, and the negative two is actually in a positive position, even though it's a negative number. And then going down, the signs alternate plus, minus, plus, and the signs continue to alternate going across and going down. 
So if I were to expand this along the top row, I would write down 4 times, well let's see now 4, 4 is in a positive position, so I'm going to emphasize that by putting a plus in front of it. And now, if I remove the row and the column that the 4 is in, I'm left with this 2 by 2 determinant right here. That's what I'm going to multiply the positive 4 by. 3, 5, 4, negative 1. Now when I go to the number 1, 1 is in a negative position, so I'll put a minus in front of that. I'll be subtracting. And if I remove the row and the column the 1 is in, I'm left with the 2 by 2 determinant, 0, 5, negative 1, negative 1. And then finally, when I go to the negative 2, negative 2 is in a positive position, so I'll put a plus in front of that. And I'll multiply by, let's see, the 2 by 2 determinant that remains when I remove the row and the column that the negative 2, is, uh, that the negative two lies in. That leaves me with 0, 3, negative 1, 4. 0, 3, negative 1, 4. Okay, so multiplying this out, I have 4 times. Now I'll go back and use my previous formula for the 2 by 2 determinant. That's going to be negative 3 minus 20 minus 1 times 0 minus negative 5. That'll make it a plus 5. And then minus 2 times 0 minus negative 3. That's 0 plus 3. So what we have here is 4 times negative, 20, ne negative 23 minus 5 minus 6. So this is going to be minus 92 minus 11 is minus 103. Minus 103. Okay, so for the case of a 3 by 3 determinant, we take the very first entry, A11, times its cofactor, minus A12, times this 2 by 2 determinant, plus A13 times the 2 by 2 determinant that remains. Let's go to an another example. Suppose we want to evaluate uh, this determinant. Let's say we put in 1, 2, negative 4, 0, 5, negative 1, uh, 2, 3, 2. Okay, so to evaluate this, I'm going to expand along the first row, and I'm going to take 1 times its cofactor. Its cofactor is the determinant 5, negative 1, 3, 2. 5, negative 1, 3, 2. Okay, now I go to the 2. The 2's in a negative position, so I'll go ahead and just put a negative out in front. And that negative is actually part of the cofactor, and the cofactor is 0, negative 1, 2, 2. 0, negative 1, 2, 2. And then I go to the 4, so now I add on a negative 4. Well, instead of adding on a negative 4, I think I'll just write minus 4 times its cofactor. Now, there won't be any sign change here because negative 4 is in a positive position, so I'll just write 0, 5, 2, 3. 0, 5, 2, 3. Now, to continue this, I have to evaluate each 2 by 2 determinant, and I do that by using the shortcut rule that we just saw a moment ago. I take this product minus that product, 1 times 10 minus negative 3. 10 minus negative 3 minus 2 times, 0 minus negative 2, 0 minus negative 2, and then minus 4 times, 0 minus 10. <coughs> well, now we just have simple arithmetic here. Uh, it's going to be 1 times uh, 10 plus 3 is 13, minus uh, 2 times, that's going to be 2, minus 4 times, negative 10. So this is 13 minus 4 plus 40. Let's see, that's going to be 53 take away 4 is 49. Is 49 is the value for that. You know, one of the reasons that these, uh, these values are referred to as determinants is because this answer is determined once you fill all those numbers in. In other words, once those numbers have been, those nine numbers have been established, then this answer has been established even if I haven't computed it yet, it, it, it can't change. As a matter of fact, if I expand on any other row or any other column, I'll get that same answer. Let's just try doing that. Um, let's see, we got 49 here, let's keep that in mind. I'm going to put a 49 up here beside it. 
And let's expand along another row or another column and uh, see if we, if, if we get the same result. So I'll just rewrite this determinant. 1, 2, negative 4, 0, 5. That's a 5 there, a little hard to read. And negative 1. And 2, 3, 2. Um, suppose we were to expand along the, the middle row. Along the middle row. Let me just circle that one so we see it highlighted. Now my first entry is 0. Uh, by the way, is 0 in a positive or a negative position? Negative. It's in a negative position. So when I write down this determinant, the cofactor determinant, 2, negative 4, 3, 2, I'll put a negative out in front to uh, adjust the sign. Of course, that product's going to be 0 anyway, so there's no real, real effect on that. Uh, next, I go to the 5. I'll put a plus 5, and I'm putting a plus because 5's in a positive position, and its cofactor if I delete the row in the column, will be 1, negative 4, 2, 2. And finally, I come to negative 1. Now, let's see, negative 1 is in a negative position. So I'll be, ha I'll be changing the sign of the cofactor. What I'll do instead is just change the sign of the negative 1, make that plus 1. And its cofactor will be 1, 2, 2, 3. Okay, <clears throat> well, without even evaluating this determinant, I can see that that product's going to be zero. So let's move to the next one. Plus five times the value of that determinant is going to be two uh, minus negative eight. And then the next one is one times three minus four. So we have uh, five times 10 plus 1 times negative 1, just negative 1. So that'll be 50 minus 1 is 49 again. Yeah, we got, we got the same result again. Uh, I would have gotten that same answer if I'd expanded on the, bottom, on the bottom row. And you know, you'll get the same answer if you expand along a column as well as a row. Let's just try doing a column expansion and verify that for one of the columns. So I'm going to take out um, that mark. Let's say we expand along the last column over here. I'll just use that one. So I'll start off by writing down a negative 4. Well, I want to change the sign of negative 4 leave it alone. In other words, will I be putting a plus or a minus in front of it? Leave it alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it, it's, it's a positive position. So there's no sign change here. And its cofactor is uh, 0, 5, 2, 3. Okay, then I come to the negative 1. Now, the, the, the negative 1 is in a negative position, so I'll make that a plus 1. And its cofactor is 1, 2, 2, 3. And then we come to the 2. Let's see now, the 2 is in a, is in a positive position, and so we'll leave it alone, plus 2, times its cofactor, which is 1, 2, 0, 5. Okay, now evaluating the two by twos, we have negative four times zero minus 10, zero minus 10, plus one times three minus four, three minus four, plus two times five minus zero. Okay, we'll keep our fingers crossed here. We think the answer is 49. Let's see if it works out. Uh, negative four times negative 10 is 40. And then 1 times negative 1 is negative 1. And then 2 times 5 is 10. Yeah, there's uh, 50 minus 1 is 49, once again. Uh, you notice we get the same answer, but we're not adding up exactly the same numbers to get it. So as you pick a different row or different column, these products and sums individually turn out to be different, but the result is the same. So that's one of the reasons why these are called de determinants, because the answer has been determined once you put the numbers in there. Uh, you know, if you were going to uh, be working this one in the future, what would be a shortcut for choosing a row or a column to expand along so that you could get the, um, so that you could come up with the answer? What, what shortcut would you suggest? Stephen? Uh, finding 
rows or columns that have zeros in them. So yeah. you can not even have to determine it because it's going right. to be zero. At, at least, at least some zero. of the products you can leave out because that would make a coefficient zero. You know, a minute ago when I expanded along the second row here, I didn't have to worry about zero times its cofactor because uh, the product's going to be zero anyway. So I think the, sh the shortest way usually is to pick the row or column that has the most zeros. If you see uh, a row or a column with, say, two zeros, by all means go for that one because um, uh, there's only one product that you'll have to actually carry out. Could you also do row operations to make one of the uh, another number of zeros so that you could have yeah yeah as a matter number. of fact those uh, those three elementary row operations that we used earlier to reduce augmented matrices we're going to be applying those to determinants uh, in in just a moment in fact that's that's coming up very quickly here that, that's a good suggestion okay we can we can summarize this with the fact that says the value of the determinant can be found by expanding by cofactors along any row or column uh, not merely uh, just along the first column like uh, we did in the, in the very beginning. Okay, uh, now let's consider the situation of uh, a matrix rather than a, than a, um, than a uh, determinant. And suppose I have a determinant, or rather a matrix A and a matrix B, and I multiply them together. Now, if I take the determinant of that product, that's the same thing as taking the determinant of A times the determinant of B separately and multiplying together. In other words, this is a number, determinant of A times the determinant of B, gives me the determinant of the product matrix. Th this is a theorem in algebra that uh, we haven't proven, but I'm going to make use of. And the way I'll make use of it is as follows. Um, suppose I have a matrix that has an inverse, which we call A inverse. Uh, that product is always an identity matrix. Now, if I take the determinant of this product, I should get the determinant of the identity matrix. And uh, you remember, in the identity matrix, you have ones along the main diagonal. So this is going to look like a one, and then a zero, and a zero, and then a zero, and a one, and a zero, and et cetera. If, if, it, were, if it were a three by three, it may not be a three by three, but the idea is I get ones along the main diagonal. Now, if I, if I evaluate this determinant by expanding along a row or column, I think you'd find out that its value is always equal to 1. So what we have is that the determinant of the product is always equal to 1. And if I use that rule that I just mentioned uh, a moment ago, the determinant of the product is the product of these two determinants separately. And so what this, what this tells me is that, a, that if a matrix has an inverse, then the determinant of A cannot be zero. Because if this had been zero, there's no way I could get a one for an answer. So what I can conclude from this is if matrix A has an inverse, then the determinant of matrix A cannot be, cannot be zero. Because if it were zero, this product could never be one. As a matter of fact, you can actually get more information out of this than what we're going to use. What we can actually determine is that the determinant of A inverse is equal to one over the determinant of A, although I don't think we'll be using that fact uh, in this course. See, what I've done is to divide by the determinant of, by, by the, by the, uh, determinant of A. So the determinant of the inverse is the reciprocal of the determinant of the original matrix. Okay, let's go to the first, to the next graphic. And uh, we have a theorem that summarizes what we've just established here. And that says that a square matrix A has an inverse if and only if the determinant of A is, is not zero. Now, uh, this is another reason why determinants are named the way they are, because it's with a determinant that you can determine whether a matrix has an inverse or not. Uh, if we come back to the green board, suppose we just take uh, this, Suppose we take this matrix. I think I'll call this one matrix B. And uh, let's say matrix B is 5, 4, negative 3, and 2. And we ask the question, um, is B an invertible matrix? You, you may remember there was another word we used for this. We might also ask the question, which is equivalent to it, is B a non-singular matrix? 
you remember non-singular meant it has an inverse. So I'm asking two questions, but they're really ask this, asking, the, the same, asking about the same idea. Well, to find out if this matrix has an inverse or not, I merely have to take its determinant and see if I get zero. If I get zero, it doesn't have an inverse. If I get anything other than zero, it does have an inverse. So if I take the determinant of five, four, negative three, two, let's see, that value would be 10 minus negative 12, and I get 22. Now, what's the most significant fact in regard to 22 at this moment? It's not zero. 22 isn't zero, so as long as it isn't zero, uh, the answer is yes, uh, B is invertible. Now, that means we might proceed by the methods we saw in the previous episode to calculate its inverse. But, uh, but what this does is it gives us a way of deciding whether there is an inverse before we go to all the trouble of actually computing it or not. Okay. Now, I'd like to show you yet another way to evaluate uh, determinants. Let's see. What we've, what we've seen is we could expand by cofactors. Uh, if it's a two-by-two two determinant, there's a shortcut because you can just take the diagonal products and subtract them. Uh, but now let me show you yet another way that we can evaluate determinants, and this is using the elementary operations that we performed on matrices earlier. Here's an example. Uh, suppose we have the determinant uh, 2, 1, 5, 3. Can anyone tell me the value of that determinant? 1. Uh, is 1, yes, because it's 6, take away 5 is 1. Now look what happens if I invert two rows. What if I switch the two rows and put 5, 3 on top and 2, 1 down below? Now what's the value of that determinant? Negative 1. Is negative 1. Yeah, it's 5 minus 6 is negative 1. As a general rule, if you have a determinant, even if it's larger, a 3 by 3 or larger, if you switch two rows, uh, you will change the sign of the determinant. By the way, if you switch two columns, you'll change the sign of the determinant. What if I switch columns uh, 1 and 2. I'll put 1, 3, and I'll put 2, 5. You notice still the product is 5, take away 6 is negative 1. So if you interchange two rows or interchange two columns, you get the negative of the determinant value that you had before. Okay, that's the first of the three elementary operations, although now these are row and column operations. Let me take another example. Um, and let's try performing a different operation on it. Suppose we have uh, 4, negative 1, 3, negative 2. What's the value of that determinant at the moment? Negative 5. Yeah, it looks like it's negative 8 minus negative 3. Negative 8 minus negative 3 uh, is uh, negative 5. Okay, uh, suppose now that I double the first row. If I double the first row only, not the second row, we have 8, negative 2, 3, negative 2. This time the answer is negative 16 minus negative 6. Let's write that down. Negative 16 minus negative 6. How much will that be? Negative 10. Negative 10. Okay, so what did we do? We, we took the original determinant, I doubled the first row, and I got double the answer. By the way, that would happen also if I double the second row. I'd double the answer. What do you think I'd get if I double the first row and the second row? Four times the answer. We'd get four times the answer because we'd double it and double it again, and this answer would have been negative 20 instead of negative 10. Uh, this also works if I double or triple or whatever a column. Let's say I multiply the first column by 5. That would make it 20 and 15, going back to the original determinant, but still leave the negative 1 and the negative 2. Then this answer will be negative 40 minus um, negative 15. That's uh, negative 40 plus 15 is negative 25. And you see this is five times the original answer. So if you take a multiple of a row or a column, uh, you will get the same multiple of the final answer. Okay, that's the second of the elementary row and column operations. Okay, now to me, this, is, this next one is the most surprising one. What if I take a multiple of one row and add it to another row, or if I take a multiple of one column and add it to another column? Let's take an example. Um, let's take 1, 
four, five, three. At the moment, the value of this determinant is uh, three take away 20 is negative 17. Now, I'm going to take a multiple of row one and add it to row two. Suppose I take uh, two times row one and add that to row two. Let's see, the way I usually write that, I think, is row two plus two times row one. Here's what the new determinant would look like. I'm not changing row one, but if I take two times row one and add it to row two, what would the new entries be on row two? Seven uh -huh. and 11. Seven and 11, okay. And so we get here, the value of this determinant is 11 take away 28 is negative 17. What's the effect on the determinant when you perform this operation? None whatsoever. Doesn't, doesn't look like it affects it at all. And as a matter of fact, that's the general rule. If you take a multiple of one row and add it to another row, or you take a multiple of one column and add it to another column, you get the same answer. Now, to me, that's surprising, because that seems like the most complicated of the three operations, and yet it has no effect. This is summarized in the next graphic on elementary operations. Uh, you'll notice the title of this graphic is not elementary row operations, but just elementary operations, because we can perform these on rows or columns. Number one, if we interchange two rows or columns in a determinant, the value of the determinant changes signs. Yeah, we saw that. We went from um, uh, a negative number to a positive number, or vice versa in our example. Number two, if we multiply a row or column by a constant, the value of the determinant is also multiplied by the constant. And then number three, if we add a multiple of one row or column to another row or correspondingly a column, the value of the determinant remains the same. Now, here's how I can use this to evaluate determinants uh, using an alternative method. Let's come back to the green board and take this example. Suppose I have the determinant 1, 1, 2, uh, 0, 3, negative 1, um, 2, negative 1, 4. Okay, so I'm just picking these numbers at random, and I'm thinking, you know, what if I were able to reduce this to a determinant that was in this form? Suppose I got um, zeros below the numbers along the main diagonal. And on and above the main diagonal, it doesn't really matter, but what if I got zeros below? Then if I were going to evaluate this determinant, what I would do is I would take this entry right here, and multiply it by its cofactor. By the way, this entry is in a positive position, so its cofactor is just these four numbers. So it'd be this entry times the value of this determinant up here. I'll just put a box around it. Now the value of this determinant is just this product minus zero. So it would be this number times this product minus zero. Or to sum it all up, it's just the product of the numbers along the main diagonal. So if I can make this determinant into this form where I have zeros below the main diagonal, then the value of the determinant is just the product along the main diagonal. It's this number times that determinant, and that determinant is just this product right here. Okay, so how can I make this determinant look like that? Well, if I perform elementary row and column operations uh, and make the appropriate, the appropriate adjustments uh, along the way using the facts that we've just seen, uh, I think we can get there. So let's see, I already have a zero here. I'd like to get a zero there and a zero there. How can I get a zero in this position? Well, let's see, I could take row three and add on negative two times row one. Row three plus negative two times row one. Okay, so this is exactly what we saw with augmented matrices earlier, but now we're doing this to determinants. One, one, two. 0, 3, negative 1. Now here's where the change comes in. This is going to be a 0. This is going to be a negative 3. And this is going to be a 0. Right there. Okay, I've got a 0, a 0. I'd like to get a 0 right here. How can, how can I do that? Add row 2 to row 3. Add row 2 to row 3. Okay. So if I add row two to row three, by the way, you know when you take a multiple of one row and add it to another row, 
uh, you're not changing the value of the determinant. So um, these, these determinants are exactly equal. 1, 1, 2, 0, 3, negative 1. Now if I add row, row 2 to row 3, then I'll get 0, 0, negative 1. 0, 0, negative 1. Okay, so at this point, I'll just take the product along the main diagonal, and that's going to be 1 times 3 times negative 1, which is 3 times negative 3, uh, excuse me, 3 times negative 1, or negative 3 is the value of the determinant. Sometimes this is the quickest way to evaluate uh, a determinant, quicker than using cofactors um, uh, to, uh, to come up with these zeros in the right positions. Let's take one more example where we do this, and this time I want to take an example where I, ha where I can factor a number out or make some other change. Okay, in this 3x3 three three determinant, <coughs> suppose we have um, 0, 2, 1, um, 5, 5, negative 10, and uh, negative 2, 1, and 4. So if I can get 1's along the main diagonal, or just anything along the main diagonal, but zeros below the main diagonal, then I can multiply along the main diagonal and get the answer. By the way, you can also do this where you get zeros above the main diagonal, and the answer will be uh, the product on the main diagonal again. Well, let's see, I'd like to get a 1 where the 0 is. Uh, can anyone suggest a way to get a 1 there? Okay, let me, uh, let, me re re let me rephrase the question. Give me several different ways you could get a, a 1 where the 0 is. What's, what's one way we could do that? You could change row 2 and row, interchange row 2 and row 1, and then divide the new row 1 by 5. Ah, okay, yeah. So what Jeff has noticed is we have a common factor of 5 there. So if we could get rid of the 5, make it a 1, 1, negative 2. If we interchange rows 1 and 2, I think we're on our way to getting a 1 in the 1, 1 position. Okay, what's another way I could get a 1 there? Interchange column one and column three. Okay, interchange columns one and three. Yeah, then that would certainly put a one there. Okay. We have to remember, though, of course, when we interchange two rows or two columns, we change the sign of the determinant, so we have to account for that. And uh, David, I think you mentioned one other way, or no? Okay. Uh, someone I thought mentioned that if you took uh, negative one half of row three and added it to row one then you'd get a 1 right there. Okay, so th those would all work. Let's try interchanging two columns, because we have the 1 already. Okay, so I'm going to put column number 3 in the first position, and I'll leave column 2 alone, and of course we have to change column 3. But you know, these two determinants are no longer equal, because when you switch two columns, you have the opposite sign. So I'm going to put a negative in front, uh, which is going to correct the sign and bring it back to bring these back to being equal. Okay, uh, by the way, what's the purpose of getting a 1? Why, why is my interest in getting a 1 there? Because it's easier to multiply by 1. Uh, well, see, the 1 is a lever, and I can use the 1 to get zeros below. Um, whereas if this had been a 3, for example, it would be kind of awkward to use a 3 to get a 0 with a negative 10. Uh, but, you know, let's do something differently here also. Instead of getting zeros below the diagonal, let's get zeros above the diagonal. One, for one reason, I already have a zero up there, so that means I only have two positions to worry about. I'd like to get a zero in this position. And to get a zero there, uh, why don't we multiply column two, column one, by negative two and add it to column two? In other words, this is going to be C2 plus negative two times C1. We've never written it that way before because we've never done a column operation quite like that before. Uh, by the way, when I take a multiple of column 1 and add it to column 2, will it change the sign of the determinant? No, it, that has no effect. But I don't want to forget to, this negative. I have to keep this negative up with me all along, so I have to keep recording that negative from the column change. Okay, column number 1 stays the same. Column number 2 becomes uh, 0. Uh, 25, 25, and um, negative 7, negative 7. I need a little bit more room, I think, on that one. In fact, let me switch markers here. And column number 3 is okay, 0, 5, and negative 2. 
Uh, now, you notice uh, in this second row, I have a common factor. So what I'd like to do is uh, factor out that 5 and call this a negative 5 out in front. So what I'm doing is I'm factoring out a common factor on that row. This is using the second elementary operation. And this becomes 1, 0, 0, negative 2, 5, 1, 4, negative 7, negative 2. So using the second elementary operation, row operation, I'm now factoring out a common factor and bringing out to make these numbers smaller. Okay, now I'd like to get a, I'd like to get a zero where that one is. What's one way I could get a zero there? Hmm. You could switch um, row two and row three yeah, I could put a 5 there and a 1 in the middle, and it'd be easier to let the, five, the 1 make the 5 into a 0 than making the 5 convert the 1 into the 0. So why don't we convert these two rows, switch those two rows, which is going to put yet another negative out in front. So now we have a plus 5. And the first column remains the same, but the third column moves into the second position, and the second column goes into the third position. And uh, Stephen's idea was that you getting a 1 in the middle, I can use the 1 to create a 0 there. So let's now do that. I'm going to take uh, negative 5 times column 2 and add it to column 3. So um, let's see, that's column 3 plus negative 5 times column 2. I'll just write that right above column 2. So I have 1, negative 2, 4. Oh, I left off my 5. That's, it's very easy to drop off those coefficients if you're not paying attention there, and I almost did the same thing. Uh, the second column becomes 0, 1, negative 2. And the third column becomes uh, 0, 0, and what's the last entry going to be? 3. Um, it's going to be 3, yeah. Okay, I have now made this into um, uh, a matrix that has zeros above the main diagonal. So if I take 5 times the product on the main diagonal, that'll be 5 times 1 times 1 times 3. This answer is... 15. Now, you know, um, you, you might say, well, Dennis, I don't know if this is really a very practical way to evaluate a 3 by 3 determinant. This one turned out to be kind of long. Uh, it, it could be that it would have taken some other steps. It could have been a little bit shorter. But um, actually, where I want to make use of this sort of a procedure is in the next problem when we talk about Kramer's rule. So let's move to, uh, to a whole new problem, but I'm still going to use this idea or these elementary operations anyway, to consider Kramer's rule. Now, first of all, let me tell you what the rule says, and then afterwards we'll go back and establish um, what it's about. Suppose I have a system of equations of the form uh, ax plus by equals a constant. We'll say the constant is r. <clears throat> and then another equation, cx plus dy equals a constant s. This is a two by two system of linear equations. Now, let's assume that this system, for the moment, has a solution. The, the word we use for that is we say, suppose it's consistent, meaning that there is a solution for this problem in exactly one solution. Then I can find the solution for x and for y by computing three determinants. Here's what I do. First of all, I compute a determinant that I'll just call capital D, and it's the coefficient determinant. That is, it's the determinant made up of the coefficients a, b, c, and d. So I have A, B, C, and D. That's easy to evaluate. It would be the product AD minus the product uh, BC. Now, there's another determinant I'm going to make up here. I'm going to call D sub X. And what the, the, the difference between this one and D is that I'm going to replace the numbers in the X column with the constants over here, R and S. I'm going to put those in place of A and C, R, S, B and D. And that would be, of course, the product RD minus the product BS. And then there's a determinant D sub Y. It's a two by two determinant. And if I go back to the original determinant, I'm going to replace the Y column with R and S. That's why I call it D sub Y. So this will be A and C in the first column, R and S in the second column. 
Now you might say, well, what's the, what's the purpose of these determinants? Well, I can calculate x by taking the ratio of d sub x over d. And I can calculate y by taking the ratio of d sub y over d. And this idea is referred to as Kramer's rule. Is, is Kramer's rule. So if you set up your determinants d, d sub x, d sub y, and then take these ratios, you will get the values for x and y. Now, the problem has to have a solution. It has to be consistent. If, if this problem has no solution, or if it has infinitely many solutions, what happens is the determinant d turns out to be 0, and you can't divide by 0. So Kramer's rule will keep you from coming up with a particular solution, because there is no particular solution. In, in that case, there, there might be no solution or infinitely many. So we say we want it to be consistent so that this determinant will not be, will not be zero right here. Okay, and by the way, this works for larger systems of equations too. If this had been a three by three system of equations, I would have had three by three determinants and there would be an extra one called d sub z down here. Uh, I think we'll, let's work an example um, using a two by two. And then, as time permits at the end, we'll go back and see why Kramer's rule works. Okay, suppose we have the system of equations uh, 3x <coughs> minus y equals 12. <coughs> and 2x plus 3y equals um, 19. And, of course, we want to solve for x and for y. Okay, and the way I get x is I take uh, d sub x and I divide by d. So I need to find both d and d sub x. And the way I get y is to take d sub y and divide by d. Okay, so I'll need to figure out what is determinant d. And then afterwards we'll get d sub x and d sub y. So determinant d is uh, 3, negative 1, 2, and 3. It's the coefficient determinant. And this gives me uh, 9 plus 2 is 11. Uh, d sub x, let's see, can you tell me what would be the entries in d sub x? Negative 1, 3, 12, and 19. Uh, no, let's see, not for d sub x. Uh, 12, yeah. negative 1, uh -huh. 19, and 3. Exactly. Yeah, see what we're doing here, Jeff, is we're putting these constants in the first column where the x's were. So the 12 and the 19 go down here and then we leave the y column alone. Uh, let's go ahead and evaluate this one. This is going to be 36, and then minus a negative 19, that's plus 19. And 36 and 19 is uh, 55, 55. Okay, now d sub y. Okay, Jeff, we'll give you another chance here. What's going to be the determinant d sub y? 12. Uh, here, no. Uh, doesn't it go, okay. Neg uh, let's see, what we're going to do is we're going to put the 12 oh, and the 19 okay. in the y column, okay. and I'll leave so the 3, 3 and the 2. 3, 12, 3 and 12 yeah. 2 and 19. And then 2 and 19. Okay, exactly. Okay, so we've, we've replaced the constants in the y column, whereas for d sub x we put them in the x column. So this gives me uh, 3 times 19. What's 3 times 19, anyone? 57. 57, right. Minus, okay, here's another one. What's 2 times 12? 24. 24, of course, yeah. Okay, so we get 33. Okay, now, if I substitute these numbers in over here, d sub x is 55 over 11, or 5, and y is 33 over 11, or 3. So our answer, I'll write it as an ordered pair, is 5, 3. That's the solution to our problem. Let's just go back and check those answers up here. I'll just put a 5 above x and a 3 above y. Uh, substituting those in, let's see, 15 take away 3 is 12, and uh, 10 plus 9 is 19. Yeah, that, that is a solution. In fact, that's the only solution. Okay, um, now I tell you what, let me just talk about a 3 by 3, but I'm not going to work out all the determinants because that'll, that'll take more time than we have. But suppose I had a 3 by 3 system that looked like this. Suppose we had x plus y plus z equals 4. And suppose we had x minus y plus 
2z is, um, suppose that's also 4. And suppose we had 2y minus z equals 0. Okay, so we have a coefficient of x there that's 0. Well, this time I'd have to set up a determinant d, a determinant um, d sub x, a determinant d sub y, and a determinant d sub z. Uh, let's see, now determinant d is just the coefficient determinant, 1, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, 2, 0, 2, negative 1. And I'd, I'd evaluate that, but I don't think I'll do that at, the, at this moment because it, it would take more time to do all four of these than we have. Now, for d sub x, I would take out the x column, and I would put 4, 4, 0 in that column. So this is the column that's going to change right here. So I'll just put the 4, 4, and 0 there. The other columns uh, are left intact. Okay, now for d sub y, I'm going to change the middle column. So I'll put the 4, 4, 0 there, and the first column stays the same, and the last column stays the same. And uh, finally, for d sub z, we'll insert 4, 4, 0 in the z column. And then this is still 1, 1, 0. That hasn't changed. And 1, negative 1, 2. Okay, then to get my answers, to get x, I would take d sub x and divide it by d. And to get y, I'd take d sub y and divide it by d. And to get z, of course, I'll take d sub z and divide it by, d, by, z, by, by d. rather, And that would reduce to give me my final answer. Okay, now, you know, I think that, uh, uh, is, why don't we go to the next graphic and uh, we, can, we can see the, the two by two case outlined. Um, that, was the, that was the model that I had written on the board a little bit earlier for the two by two. For a consistent linear system, uh, x is equal to d sub x over d, and those are the determinants that you'd evaluate, and y is equal to d sub y over d. Okay, so let's spend our last few minutes here just looking at a justification for this. Uh, you know, we have, if we have the system of equations ax plus by equals r, and cx plus dy equals s, then the coefficient determinant, what we call d, uh, is just a, b, c, and d. Now, uh, suppose I were to multiply this determinant by x. Okay, so I have x times this, determinant, this coefficient determinant. Now, you know, when you multiply by x, then you can multiply any row or any column by x. So I'm going to multiply the first column by x, because that's where you'd expect to see the x's, I suppose. So this is ax, cx, b and d. Because for determinants, when you multiply by a constant, you can multiply any row or any column by the constant. OK, now, um, I'm going to take a multiple of column 2 and add it to column 1. So the multiple I'm going to take is y times column 2 and add it to column 1. So if I take y times column 2 and add it to column 1, this will be ax plus by, and this will be cx plus dy. Uh, but then we haven't really changed column 2, so that remains b and c. So all of this is column 1, and then this little bit is column 2. Okay. Now, let's see, we have ax plus by. Given my original system, ax plus by was equal to r. So let's replace this with r, and cx plus dy, that's really s, so let's just put an s there. So what we have here is uh, r, b, s, d. And I think I'll just bring this down. x times this determinant, a, b, c, d, is equal to the determinant over here. I've, in other words, I've actually begun with this, and I, it's evolved into this other expression. Now, you know, what, what this is, is actually the determinant we call d. We have x times determinant d. And over here, this is what we were calling determinant uh, d sub x, because you see I have the constants in the x column. So x is equal to d sub x divided by d. That's the justification for uh, the rule, Kramer's rule for x. You know, if I wanted to derive the rule for y equals d sub y over d, how do you think this would, 
this would have begun differently. Would have started off with a y outside the determinant. Multiply by a y. Yeah, and what do you think the next step would be? How would I bring the y into the problem? Times it by the second column. Right. Instead of multiplying y in the first column, multiply y into the second column. And this remains a and c. This becomes by and dy. Then I'd take a multiple of a and c and I'd add it to the second column. So I would begin to build a more complex expression in the second column rather than the first column. Then I would replace each of those expressions with r and s right here instead of here. And we would have uh, y times determinant d and this would be determinant d so y. Now the only the only problem a person might uh, only question a person might bring up I suppose at this point is Dennis can you divide by d I mean what if you're divide by zero well I don't think we've justified this but it wouldn't be that difficult to do so is that if this system of equations is consistent the coefficient determinant will not be zero but uh, that's never been established but that is the case so if this is consistent this determinant won't be zero I could divide by it and that's how we isolate the x and that's how we isolate uh, the y for, for Kramer's rule. Well, you know, if we sort of recap what we've done today, we started off introducing determinants for the simplest case, two by two, and we said that you could just take the cross product, the two diagonals, and subtract those products to evaluate that determinant. For three by three determinants and larger, you expand by cofactors, and uh, in that case, you pick any row or any column, and you expand along it, and you take each entry times the corresponding cofactor, which is a determinant, with, an, with the appropriate sign placed in front of it, either a plus or a minus. Uh, you know, we didn't do a four by four or a five by five determinant, but they're done in exactly the same way. You expand along a row or column, and let's say if it's a four by four, the cofactors will be three by threes. And then each of those cofactors have to be evaluated separately as three by three determinants. Uh, then we saw that there was, uh, there was an alternative, I don't know if you'd call it a shortcut, and that's where you make the determinant into a diagonal and multiply along the main diagonal. I'll see you next time in episode 26.